Hello, everybody. I'd like to get started. I'm Mara Yale. I direct this direct educational this education. series in collaboration with a bunch of other parents and uh, doctors who oversee this program. We're, um, I'm going to give a short overview of our educational series and ways that you can get involved and help. And then I will introduce the topic by talking about my own family story and then hand it off to Alyssa, our speaker for today. Okay, so as um, as you know, because you registered, the topic today is language development after pediatric stroke, and more specifically, uh, developmental plasticity and language outcomes after perinatal stroke, which is the subject of Alyssa Newport's research. And I think it's really interesting and important to um, understand the difference between language and speech. And she'll get into that a little bit to help us understand those differences. As uh, all of you know, because you either have a child who's had a stroke or perhaps you're yourself, or um, maybe you work with kids who've had strokes, uh, having a stroke as a baby or as a child can affect the whole lifespan in different ways. and. We like to say here that we're taking things outside of the hospital context and into life. Just as a disclaimer, we are not offering medical advice here. Everything here is educational. When we do get to the discussion section, we just ask that you ask your questions in a general way so it's not so much to make decisions about your own child situation. Uh, think, thanks for considering that. and. Where have we been? We've been at this now um, more than five years. We we talk a lot about developmental curves today in the in the context of language, um, but we've also been growing our community of um, of researchers, but also community organizations, clinicians, and families most at at our core. And um, we invite you to check out this growing library of past events and um, and help us keep this going. So there are a bunch of ways for you to get involved and I will post these links in the chat so you can uh, answer the survey that I sent out this afternoon uh, or email us to, to share ideas for future topics or to volunteer to get involved in any way. You can find our past events and um, once we set the schedule for next year, you'll be able to register through that same link. And then finally, you can donate or start your own fundraiser. And we really need your contributions in any form to keep this program going. So I um, am in this because of also being a parent to a child who had a perinatal stroke. In my case, my child had a left middle cerebral artery stroke. It was diagnosed early at two days old because uh, my child presented with seizures. So once I knew that um, the stroke was on the left side, we were you know, sort of given a hopeful prognosis that, that my child would be more or less typical. That was what the neurologist said to us, in, said to me um, in the NICU. So I was shocked and um, worried, and I was particularly worried about possible impact on my child's language development because I knew that uh, that the stroke had hit the language centers. Um, but there's not a lot to do at the beginning except do all the things that I was doing anyway with my two and a half year old who was my first child, reading a lot, uh, having a language rich home, and um, continuing that for both of my children. I uh, had an opportunity to send my kids to a bilingual elementary school, a Spanish immersion program. And for childcare, because I knew that was coming, I set up uh, au pairs to help support my family. And the, the au pairs were Spanish speaking. And so my, my younger child, who's the one who had the stroke, was exposed to Spanish at home starting at about three years old. And this child did not have a lot of words. Um, they, they could talk, they certainly could talk and make their needs met, but in most settings um, outside the home, they were pretty quiet. 
And I remember being delighted when they started kindergarten and the um, the kindergarten teacher said at the fall conf parent teacher conference, I know that your child is understanding because they're one of the first to laugh at my jokes in Spanish. And, um, and fluency, hu like understanding humor is actually a fairly sophisticated measure of language comprehension. And I remember thinking, wow, my kid is not only, you know, speaking and, and understanding English, but also now understanding um, Spanish and, and later producing speech in both languages. Um, and then interestingly for me, this, this child um, has gone on to have really a sophisticated written communication. So I often am, am kind of blown away when I see their writing and in relation to the, the speech that they produce. So I find it fascinating, like what's going on in the brain that a kid who comes across as quite quiet has a very rich inner life and, um, language repertoire, vocabulary, sentence structure, all of that. So I'm um, really pleased today that we have Alyssa Newport to inform and educate us about language development and share some of her research findings. I'm going to turn it over to her to more fully introduce herself and her research. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I uh, just need to share my slides. Okay. Um, so, um, as Mara said, I'm going to be talking today about developmental plasticity after perinatal stroke. Um, as I will try to explain later, we're not sure whether what I'm going to say applies to stroke later in childhood, and that's a very, very important question. Um, what I want to do here is just point out to you, and you'll see all their pictures in a minute, that um, this is not at all just me. Um, I'm a PhD researcher, but I work with physicians who work on uh, perinatal stroke as well and help diagnose and identify who should be in our research. Um, and so I'll tell you who these people are when I get to their photos. Um, let me start talking about what our research is about. Um, we are, I am a cognitive neuroscientist, which means I have some basic research questions about what's called developmental plasticity, which I'll explain in a minute. Um, and we hope, of course, that our research also has important clinical applications, but I'm not myself a clinician. Um, what we are interested in is language in particular after left hemisphere perinatal stroke, as Mara said. Um, so let me first uh, talk about what developmental plasticity means in my field. Um, developmental plasticity means um, to what degree is the brain capable of changing in response to experience or to injury um, early in life. Um, there's a lot of research that talks more generally about how much can the brain reorganize as we learn new things. Obviously, all our lives we can learn and remember new information. So the brain is always changing every day. Um, but it has been argued in our field that there's a lot more plasticity or reorganization capability in very young children. Uh, we don't know how long that lasts. So I'm going to just use the the term developmental plasticity in a very general way, uh, that uh, there are two kinds of uh, evidence or interests in developmental plasticity. One of them is um, without injury, are children better at learning language, for example, than adults are? And I've done lots of research on that topic previously. That's been the line of research that I've mostly done in my career. Um, the answer is yes, uh, it looks to us like children are better at learning language, although obviously people learn languages when they're adults. Um, but if you start as a child, the outcomes are indeed better. But what I want to focus on today is what happens if you have a stroke? If a child has a stroke, do children recover differently than adults who have a stroke? Um, what happens uh, exactly in the brain as they learn language after having a stroke to language areas. 
And also we want to know what are the mechanisms that uh, underlie developmental plasticity if it exists. Um, what are the brain mechanisms? Uh, what, what happens in the brain if language areas are damaged by a stroke? And what is the outcome, the long-term outcome for language abilities? So that's the kind of question that we've been focusing uh, on on our research. Um, the evidence previous to our starting this on um, left hemisphere perinatal stroke injury has been quite mixed. So some of my colleagues have argued that the left hemisphere is really necessary for language. The kids aren't going to develop language normally if the left hemisphere is injured. And there's two kinds of evidence for this. One is that if you look at people who have never had a stroke, um, sentence comprehension and production are strongly left lateralized in healthy adults. What that means is if we look at the adult brain, uh, anybody after, let's say, uh, college, late teenage years, um, and you look at what parts of the brain are active when we understand or produce sentences, um, it's really the left hemisphere that takes the dominant lead in that. And the right hemisphere is involved in other things, but not centrally um, in, in control of language comprehension and production. Um, it's also been argued by some of my colleagues that even after a stroke in very early childhood or at birth, what's left in the left hemisphere, the tissue that still remains after a stroke is really essential for recovery. However, that's not the only view that people have taken. Um, some people have said, well, there's really such extensive plasticity in young children that you can use almost any part of the brain to recover language. And then a third uh, view, which is really what I'm going to focus on and what our results show, is that there is early developmental plasticity. There's lots of recovery and uh, normal development of language in uh children who have a stroke at birth, but it's very constrained in what part of the brain takes over. And what I'm gonna argue, and I'm gonna show you the data for this, is that when the left hemisphere language areas are injured with a stroke, the right hemisphere, exactly analogous areas, what are called homotopic areas, are the only ones that ever take over. And they can take over extremely well and extremely thoroughly when the left hemisphere has an injury. So let me show you about that. Our research focuses on this very selected population. We're now moving into other kinds of groups of kids who have had strokes at different ages and in different territories. But we started by trying to get a very selected population where we had very specific um, requirements for inclusion and exclusion in our studies, simply because we wanted to see if a very restricted group, a very well-defined group, showed very uniform kinds of outcomes. And then we can move to other groups to ask the same question. So what we've been looking at is children who've had a single left hemisphere injury, a perinatal, uh, what's technically called a perinatal arterial ischemic stroke to the left hemisphere. So that's a stroke caused by a clot in an artery, happens around the time of birth to the left hemisphere territory, which I'll show you, um, with no other accompanying disorder or diseases. And what we've been looking at is not babies themselves, but looking at the long-term outcome many years after the stroke. So what we do is we find um, families, kids who have had a stroke at birth. A lot of our um, participants come from permission to examine the medical records at Children's National Medical Center, but we also have volunteers. We advertise our research and we get families who volunteer. But we're looking for kids who are 12 or older. 12 to 25 is the range of people that we're looking at. So we're looking at really long-term outcomes. We're not following exactly what happens in the early stages, which some of my colleagues do, but looking at what are the long-term outcomes many years after the stroke. So um, this is the typical definition of perinatal stroke. It's defined as occurring 28 weeks gestation to 28 days postnatal. So there's a period of definition for when it's called perinatal, but mostly uh, the kids that we study 
have had their stroke right around birth, um, or sometimes often it's been identified later, but um, attributed to a stroke right around the time of birth because of the way the stroke looks. You can tell what kind of stroke it was from what it looks like in the brain imaging. And these are kids who have been born after a typical full-term pregnancy with no complications. Um, and the cause of perinatal stroke, as I'm sure many of you know, is not known. It might be a placental clot, um, but, not, but it's not really known what causes a perinatal stroke. They are much more common than um, childhood strokes. Childhood strokes are very, very rare. Um, that's because kids don't have plaque in their arteries, which is what causes strokes in adults. Um, but there are other causes of childhood stroke, but they're much more rare. And we're starting now to look at childhood strokes, but much harder to find um, people who have had them, children who have had them. But the perinatal stroke is typically said to account for 30% of hemiplegic cerebral palsy of kids born at full term. So it's relatively common among childhood strokes, but very uncommon in terms of the number of um, occurrences in children as a whole. These are my colleagues. Um, and I just wanna point out my, one of my main collaborators is Bill Guyard, who is the chief of child neurology at Children's National Medical Center. He is also the chief of epilepsy. Um, at Children's, and so I depend a great deal on his medical um, examination of the kids and his medical examination of the medical records to make sure who we include. Um, Barbara Landau at Johns Hopkins, Peter Turkeltab, who is an adult aphasia uh, stroke neurologist, Anna Greenwald, who is a cognitive neuroscientist uh, who does a lot of our imaging analyses. And then we have students and colleagues uh, this is Rebecca Icord from CHOP. Um, we have neuropsychologists. So we have a bunch of people who participate in many different ways. And then in the middle are our students and recruiters, our staff who do recruiting and who do some of our testing. Um, this is an image of what um, a perinatal stroke, a typical perinatal stroke looks like in a young baby. And I want to just draw your attention. I'm sure that all of you have seen um, imaging, but you may or may not. The parents that I meet with may or may not have had a clear explanation. So people are not always clear what they're looking at. Um, I should also say, when you look at imaging from a radiologist, um, they have it oriented backwards from what we do. So this means the left hemisphere is on the left, the right hemisphere is on the right. You might think that that's the way everybody would show their imaging, but in fact, that's the opposite of what radiologists do. Radiologists are envisioning that they're looking up the feet of somebody lying in a scanner. And when you're looking up the feet uh, of a person, the, right, the left hemisphere is on the right and the right hemisphere is on the left. And that's the way radiologists always show their imaging. Cognitive neuroscientists do it more simply. We like the left on the left and the right on the right. So that's what's being shown here. This is um, what's called an axial slice. So it's a slice through here. Uh, and the top of the, this is the eyes up here, back of the head. This is the central sulcus. And this is the territory that's been um, affected by the stroke. So this is the territory in a textbook kind of fashion of what is fed by the middle cerebral artery. Um, there are carotid arteries here that divides into the middle cerebral artery and other pathways. And then this territory is basically all of this region here that I'm showing. That's here. This white um, look is early in a stroke and the tissue is damaged, but it hasn't washed away yet. And you'll see in my later imaging, what happens after anyone has a stroke is that the damaged tissue dries up, it's replaced by cerebrospinal fluid. So it looks different on the imaging that I'm gonna show you, but I'll show you that this territory will look black on the other kinds of imaging that I'm gonna show you because it's filled in with cerebrospinal fluid. And this is what um, uh, undamaged tissue uh, looks like in the brain.
So most of the perinatal strokes are actually um, middle cerebral artery strokes. It's because of the, the pathways that run from the heart to the brain. Um, and it could be a partial or complete middle cerebral artery um, uh, damage. So what I just showed you is the complete middle cerebral artery territory is damaged by the stroke. The clot in the artery uh, cuts off oxygen, uh, cuts off blood supply, which carries oxygen, and those areas are damaged after only a few minutes of not getting oxygen. Um, a partial MCA stroke is the middle cerebral artery splits into an inferior and superior branch. So the front um, is what in an adult will produce what's called Broca's aphasia. The back is what in an adult will typically produce a Wernicke's aphasia. So you'll see in a minute, and I'll show you uh, strokes that are only partial or complete middle cerebral artery strokes. And clinically, um, kids who have a perinatal stroke will have a mild hemiparesis of the opposite side of the body that does not appear at birth. Um, it appears as the cortex um, takes over control of motor activities. Um, if the stroke doesn't hit the motor strip, then there won't be any motor impairment. But in any case, in children, the hemiparesis is typically much milder than what you'd see with a stroke in an adult. A stroke to those same regions in an adult will produce often complete uh, paralysis of that side of the body. That doesn't happen in kids. Um, kids will have some uh, restriction of finger movement. Um, they may not be able to write or hold a pen, and so they often become left-handed, but they can move their arm without any trouble, and they do have some typically some finger motion, but it's not as fine a, a control of the fingers as you would see without a stroke. And there are also some executive function deficits, some limitations often, but not always, um, some limitations in short-term memory, um, in planning and in speed that, I'm, that are very mild, and I'm gonna explain those later. But the question we wanted to ask is what about their language? So what is language? Um, I just want to clarify that in my field, language is distinct from other aspects of cognition, even including reading. So what I'm going to mean by language is language is the ability to understand or produce the sounds particular to speech, um, the pronunciation of words or the understanding of individual word meanings, um, and especially the ability to understand sentences. There are lots of other things that you might think of as called communication or language. The, I'm gesturing now. Gestures are not considered part of language. They're obviously part of communication, but I'm not defining them as part of language. In my field, they're not included. They're called uh, paralinguistic. Even reading is not part of what I'm going to talk about as language. Um, there's a very narrow definition of language that's part of linguistics, and the evidence for that is that those things I'm calling language have a very particular developmental timetable in the um, uh, brain when there's no stroke. There's a particular set of timing that we admit that we uh, envision for the acquisition of words and the comprehension of sentences. And it's really different than reading. Reading is actually not done around the world by every culture. There's many languages of the world don't even have print. Reading can be acquired at many different ages, but early language um, is uh, acquired pretty much the same time regardless of education and culture, and definitely regardless of literacy. So I'm defining language to be those things that appear on this very early uh, developmental timetable that really don't depend on going to school, but only on being immersed in your language from your um, culture, from the surrounding world, and learning from that how to um, recognize and produce words and sentences. It's also distinct from executive function. So by that, I mean, um, language can be just fine, even if people have a, a measured in the lab limitation on short-term memory, or if they're slow, if they're disfluent and can't 
repeat words as quickly as uh, would be the case without a stroke. So I'm gonna define that differently from executive function and you'll see in a minute why. Our methods are, we use functional imaging. This is not what's done by um, neurologists or in the clinic typically, but it's something that's used by cognitive neuroscientists to measure what part of the brain is active when you do a task in the magnet. And so we're going to use listening to sentences that I'll show you in a few minutes. We also have behavioral tasks, which we've been very careful about, uh, very fussy about picking. We want behavioral tasks that are really natural uh, comprehension and production, not some task that requires that you bring in your executive function. So many clinical tasks will ask things like um, give kids cards on which words are printed, put them out on the table and ask them to assemble them to make sentences. And that measures some aspects of language, but it's not at all natural comprehension and production. It also engages, that kind of task also engages short-term memory, shifts of attention, planning, which are called executive functions. And since we know that um, kids who have a stroke do have the likelihood of some effect on executive functions. We have wanted our behavioral tasks to be as light on executive function, to not demand executive function abilities, but measure more natural comprehension and production. So listen to sentences and identify a picture, um, look at pictures and speak, uh, tell a story, et cetera. Those are the kinds of behavioral tasks we use. So here is the one of the main tasks we use. It's called the Auditory Description Decision Task developed by my colleague, Bill Gaillard. And so this is now done in the scanner to produce functional imaging to see what part of the brain uh, is responsible for listening to speech. Um, they listen to sentences one at a time. So the sentences are things like, a big gray animal is an elephant or a king's wife is an apple. And after each sentence, the child just has to push a button. They have a button and button box in their hand. They push a button if the sentence sounds correct. And the difficulty of the sentences are adjusted depending on the age of the child by changing the word frequency of these fat last words like elephant or apple. So we take highly frequent words in the child's uh, age range and make the sentences simple or a little more complicated depending on how old the children are. So they're listening to sentences one at a time. And then- An underwater ship is a submarine. That's an example. Um, and then there's another block uh, in the scanner where they hear the same recordings played backwards and they have to push a button if you hear a beep. Near buses, but it should all were not- and the purpose of that backward speech is that that allows us to look at the parts of the brain that are activated by just the noise of speech without any comprehension. So if we compare these two conditions, we look at the parts of the brain that are active when they listen to sentences versus the part of the brain that's active when they just listen to sounds, similar sounds that are not comprehensible if we subtract those regions from one another, we should be able to tell what part of the brain specifically is used for language comprehension. Um, and what I mean by active, the way that the scanner measures active is that when parts of the brain are used, they call for blood, uh, which carry, they're, they're calling for more oxygen. And that uh, carries a tiny bit of iron and that's measured by the magnet. And so uh, the magnet, which is amazing, the people who have developed this won the Nobel Prize for this work. Um, you can tell by doing this kind of functional task in the scanner, what part of the brain is specifically active. And you'll see in a minute, we, we color them with different colors. Uh, and that's representing the brain activity of the speech versus minus the brain activity of backward speech. So this is now a look at the brain for um, uh, a large body of children and adults that have been tested in Bill Gaillard's lab. And now we're looking at the sides. So this is the eyes, back of the head, 
This is looking at the left side of the brain and you can see this big swath of activity. We color it orange and red to indicate how active those regions are. And these are the regions that are active when people listen to um, the task I just told you about minus backward speech. And you can see from the right side, this is looking at the right side of the brain. The right side is typically not very active. It's really very, what's called left lateralized. It's the left hemisphere, frontal uh, cortex and temporal cortex that are um, wildly active when you listen to language, um, not just sound, but language in particular. This is now the same uh, uh, imaging, but now shown in that view I was talking about earlier, the axial slice. So let me go back here. We're now taking a slice right through here um, from an axial point of view. And what that's gonna do is pick up a piece of this frontal activation and a piece of the temporal activation. And so now you're looking at the eyes up here, back of the head here, left hemisphere on the left. And this is the frontal activation. This is the temporal activation. And if you look at these, this is now college students that we ran at Georgetown um, doing the same task. And you can see this is characteristic and this is what I want you to look at these blobs of activation that are in the left hemisphere in these reproducible um, places. This is a group average. It's gonna look more patchy when I show you individuals, but I'm gonna show you individuals in a minute. So now remember, this is what a common perinatal stroke looks like. If I switch back and forth between these, this is the activation in a group of college students. This is a perinatal stroke. You can see that this stroke is gonna damage all of the areas that are ordinarily active in listening to sentences. So the question is what is gonna be the outcome after you have a stroke like this? In an adult, um, adults don't typically survive a stroke this big. This is a very, very large stroke for an adult, but babies are fine. Um, their skulls are not fused. Uh, they. They seem to do uh, actually perfectly well uh, after a stroke like this. But um, the question is, what happens to language? If an adult does have a stroke like this, an adult will simply not be able to um, speak or comprehend speech. Typically, there will be a massive effect on their language abilities if, the, if an adult had a stroke of this size. We test their siblings. So in addition to having the families come in to test kids who have had a perinatal stroke, remember we're testing them when they're 12 or older. Um, we also ask the families uh, if they have a sibling who would be interested in participating too. And we use the siblings as our control group because um, the siblings have grown up in a similar environment and a similar socioeconomic status. And this is just to make sure what our measures produce in a, another family member. Um, so again, this is the eyes at the top, back of the head, left on the left. And these are three different siblings. So this is not an average data. This is individual um, data. Uh, and you can see in each of the siblings, you get that same patch of activation in the left side, frontal and temporal. There's also a bit of activation in the right, but it's very, very strongly left lateralized in these three. And we have um, uh, 15 siblings that we've tested. Um, we also have 18 or 20 kids who are meet the criteria that I talked about who had a perinatal left hemisphere MCA stroke. And so what happens if we give them the same task? The first thing I wanna do before I talk about the activation is just draw your attention to what strokes, the perinatal strokes look like. This uh, stroke and this stroke are very much like what I showed you in the baby where you have a complete MCA infarct. So it's that's the MCA territory that's damaged and as we get older, as one gets older, that tissue, as I said, dries up, is replaced by uh, cerebrospinal fluid. And on this particular kind of scan, it looks black. 
but um, it's just filled with cerebrospinal fluid. It's very stable. Um, and these individuals have had um, a stroke to the superior branch of the MCA or the inferior branch of the MCA. So this is a frontal infarct that would in an adult likely produce a Broca's aphasia. In an uh, adult, this would produce a Wernicke's aphasia. Um, they would be very language impaired in an adult. And this young lady had um, a carotid stroke that took out her entire left hemisphere. Um, I, uh, but amazingly, um, the kids that we study are doing really, really well. As Mara said, um, this is known for perinatal stroke, that children who have these strokes do well. This young lady was uh, an eighth grade honor student at the time we tested her. So remarkable performance. But now our question is, uh, and all of them are great. We've tested kids um, who now have their master's degrees, uh, who are honor students in high school. Um, I got an email from one of our participants last fall telling me that he was starting his freshman year at Yale. So they do really, really well, amazingly compared to what an adult with the same kind of stroke would do. If we now turn our attention to the activation, as they're listening to sentences, you can see that in every one of these kids, the activation is in the right hemisphere instead of the left, even if there's some tissue in the left hemisphere that's undamaged. The language system as a whole seems to shift over to the opposite hemisphere, and it's exactly the opposite regions. It's the homotopic regions um, of the right hemisphere in every child that takes over uh, when there's damage to the left. And this is just to show you overall, over the group, what happens. This is now looking at the side again, and uh, at the top is the sibling group. And this is showing you the number of participants, dark blue is more, um, who have their language activation for this task in the left frontal and temporal lobe, very little activation in the right. But in contrast, the kids who have had a perinatal stroke to the left have their activation in these corresponding regions of the right, right frontal and right temporal. So uh, really, it's a very consistent pattern of what shows up in the activation. And then we've also wanted, of course, to ask, well, how well does the right hemisphere actually support language? Um, as I've said, after a stroke, children may have executive function impairments. So we want to be careful about selecting what our language tasks are. We want to assess language comprehension and production but we don't want to impose any extra executive function demands. So what we do is use some basic comprehension and production tasks. This is one that comes from um, a, ta a battery used by speech pathologists. Um, it's called the Self Basic Language Ability, Sentence Comprehension and Morphology. Um, this is just listening to simple sentences and pointing at pictures or completing uh, word endings. Um, this is not my favorite task, but it's the only one of the self that I really use at all. Um, the self, which is widely used um, in the field of speech pathology is not, uh, at, not at all free of executive function demands. So, mm -hmm. we, uh, so um, um, sorry, I'm now getting a- sorry, I'm now uh, an echo. I think somebody has their mic. Sorry, uh, let me back up and explain. I was muted for a second. Hope you can hear me now. Um, but this is the self. Uh, the blue is sentence comprehension scores. You can see this goes up to 100%. And for both the sibling group labeled controls and our perinatal stroke group, um, they're almost perfect on the simple sentence comprehension task and almost perfect on word comprehension. And there's no difference between the siblings and the kids who have had a perinatal stroke. We also have harder tasks. So we wanna make the tasks 
harder while still keeping them more natural. So um, this one is one where you give kids an active sentence like John hit the John hit Mary and a passive sentence like Mary was hit by John. The passives are typically um, received more errors by everyone. Um, and so it pulls the performance off the ceiling, but you can see that our two groups are identical on the actives as well as the passives. Everybody makes some mistakes on the passives, but they're equally um, often made by the two groups. And this one is called the TROG2 made by Dorothy Bishop. It has, it's a comprehension of sentence structure task and it gets, it starts easy and then it gets harder and harder as you go along. Um, and the overall scores, there are no difference between our groups and they're almost perfect. Um, but we can look much more carefully at these are the most complex sentence structures in the test. And if we look just at our siblings, you can see that these three structures get really hard and lots of people make mistakes. Um, this is a, what's called a center embedded sentence. They're complicated sentences to process. Um, but our perinatal stroke kids look exactly the same as their siblings. There's no difference, even when they're very, very difficult. They really show exactly the same performance um, as their siblings do. Um, uh, I'm going to go through the next part real quickly, so I, I leave plenty of time for questions. So what is ordinarily done by these regions in the right hemisphere that are now taking over left hemisphere functions? What do those regions ordinarily do? The regions in the right hemisphere, frontal and temporal cortex, ordinarily do what are called suprasegmental aspects of language. They're responsible for processing the intonation of sentences, um, the uh, expression of emotion, like uh, the vocal emotion of someone being angry or someone being happy or sad, um, and individual voice recognition, recognizing the voices of individual people. So we have developed a task. This is Anna Greenwald, one of my uh, collaborators. We've developed a task that asks, well, now in the magnet, what happens with the right hemisphere, which is already occupied doing sentence processing, what happens if we have to recognize emotions, happy, sad, or angry? So in this task, they have a block of sentences that are spoken with happy, sad, or angry vocal emotion. And that's compared with neutral emotion, where there's no emotion, but it's about eating or giving gifts or going on a trip. And if you do that with people who have not had a stroke, this is Georgetown College students again, then uh, again, this is the eyes, back of the head, left on the left, right on the right. Uh, this task activates those right hemisphere, frontal and temporal regions. Um, and so now what happens if you try to do this with kids who's, who are busy using those areas for their sentence processing? And so this is showing you the six kids again. These are just examples from our much larger group. Um, but this is now coloring the sentence processing task, what we call the ADDT, a lot in blue, and also the emotional vocal recognition called prosody in orange. And what you can see is that they do both functions in the right hemisphere, every child, they don't overlap. So if they overlapped, it would look like this. There's a little bit of purple here um, if these two functions activate overlapping regions. But by and large, the two functions find different regions. They integrate in the same re large region of the hemisphere, but they don't overlap in the exact same tissue. They each find their place in the right hemisphere and they do very well on both tasks. So remarkably, somehow the right hemisphere now is doing more things. It's doing the job of the left as well as the job of the right without impairment. Um, so, sorry, this is, I'm just gonna take you through this quickly. Uh, I just wanna say we've also looked at kids who have right hemisphere 
perinatal strokes. Everything I said so far is about left hemisphere perinatal stroke with everything shifting over to the healthy right tissue. Now what happens if you have a right hemisphere perinatal stroke? And the answer is going to be everything now shifts over in a complementary way to the left. So uh, if we look at emotional prosody, which is ordinarily in the right, it's now in the left. These are now right hemisphere strokes, and those right hemisphere, uh, the right hemisphere functions are now showing up in the left. And again, this is both tasks now show up in the left. The blue is sentence processing, the orange is emotional uh, processing. And these are a bunch of right hemisphere strokes, but uh, both functions are now showing up in the left. So the perfectly complementary outcome. And we found the same kind of thing happening with visual spatial skills also. I'm going to skip over this, but we also give visual spatial tasks. And if you have damage to the right parietal area, which does some visual spatial tasks, they uh, those skills develop in the left parietal cortex. So everything looks like it's sort of a complementary picture in all the kinds of perinatal strokes that we've looked at. Let me just summarize so I leave time for questions. Um, the bottom line here is that this is amazing early plasticity. So yes, there is remarkable developmental plasticity. These outcomes don't happen in adults who have the same kind of stroke. If children have a stroke at birth, they do develop these abilities well, um, and they develop in parts of the brain that do not usually do these functions. So this is pretty remarkable. Um, but I also want to emphasize this kind of plasticity is very specific. Um, functions don't just go any old place in the brain. Um, things that are ordinarily in right frontal temporal sorry, in left frontal temporal, go to right frontal temporal. Things that are ordinarily in right frontal temporal go to left frontal temporal. Things that are ordinarily in right parietal go to left parietal. So there are very specific areas of the brain, certain parts of the brain that can develop certain types of cognitive functions and not every function can develop anywhere. That's what we seem to see. Um, but as long as you have injuries that are confined to one hemisphere and they're very early in life, it looks like the homotopic regions of the brain can take over those kinds of functions. Um, the other thing I want to emphasize is that we believe it's really important to test for language and executive functions separately. Um, we do also give executive function tasks and kids who have perinatal strokes often, not always, but often have executive function limitations. They're mild. They lead children to want to need extra time on tests in school. They may be a little bit slower if you ask them to do something as fast as possible. They often need help from mom in organizing their day or their homework, um, and that will become new habits as they get older. Um, but we uh, like to test for language separately from looking at executive function because these are not the same kind of cognitive ability. Language doesn't look like it has any impairments by the time we look at teenagers and young adults. My colleague's data does suggest that language may sometimes develop a little more slowly, but it goes through the same stages of development and what we look at is long-term outcomes, which look excellent. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to emphasize, which is really a thank you to families, is that children with perinatal stroke are really, really helping us to make breakthroughs in understanding what developmental plasticity is and how the brain develops and is organized, and maybe future breakthroughs in how to treat adult stroke. Um, I don't primarily study adult stroke, but my colleagues do. And since adults do not recover the way children do naturally, the way that children recover 
may allow us to identify good ways of stimulating uh, of an improved recovery for adults who have strokes who do not uh, spontaneously recover as well as children who have perinatal strokes. Okay, thank you so much for your attention. I'm happy to take questions. Thanks, Alyssa. I'm gonna to switch to the gallery view and invite you to do the same. Um, please come on camera and off mute if you have questions. I see Yari has asked a question in the chat. Yari, are you able to ask it out loud? You can raise your electronic hand or raise your actual hand or type in the chat if you have questions. So I'm not hearing from Yari, so let, um, let's, um, Catherine, can you, I mean, Alyssa, can you just answer that one from Yari? I'm wondering if, um, if there's a case where there was some left hemisphere and right hemisphere stroke. Uh, hold on, let me go back to Yari. Um, that's a very good question. We do not have any cases of kids where both uh, hemispheres are damaged. If I mean, from what we see, that would really be a pickle um, because everything seems to shift to exactly the homotopic region. So I don't know. I mean, a very important question for many children um, would it be at all possible for a completely different area, not the homotopic area, to take over the function? And I really don't know the answer to that. We don't have any studies of that. Thanks. Uh, Marty, can you um, ask your question? Hi, uh, this is actually her daughter. Um, so I know that there are some places that are studying a TMS with constraint-induced therapy. Is that by any chance being studied with speech as well or no? Um, that's a really good question. So let me just make sure everybody knows the background to your question. Um, so um, there are two things that are um, mentioned in your question. One is what happens if you have constraint-induced therapy, which is done in the motor system. So the idea is what happens if you have a stroke that hits the motor strip and it creates a hemiparesis on the opposite side? What happens if you constrain the person from using the um, unimpaired limb and make them use only the impaired limb? Does that actually produce beneficial effects? And the answer is yes. It does in the motor system. It's not clear that it's uh, the effects are because of the constraint as opposed to the extra use. So uh, there is not a clinical trial that I know of that just looks at extra use of the um, impaired side without imposing constraint because of course, naturally people will tend to try to use the unimpaired side. Um, so you have to constrain them to prevent them from doing that. But in any case, there is some mild effect of constraint-induced uh, movement in the motor system. There's also some, there are also some clinical trials using TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation, to try to pick out areas of the brain that you'd like to stimulate more. And in the motor system, you would do that during reaching, um, so you would try to stimulate the areas that you want to be responding during reaching. If we did the same kind of thing in language, in speech, what we would do is to uh, stimulate uh, the uh, whatever area we decided to focus on to try to see whether we could get that area to activate more um, during, let's say, particular kinds of speech therapy. Um, it's not clear how you would do constraint. Um, I mean, what you'd want to, we don't have a way of constraining one part compared to the other part of the brain unless we did some kind of, I mean, you can actually do repetitive TMS and inhibit the left hemisphere and try to stimulate the right or vice versa. And so there are a number of trials in adults trying to stimulate the 
chromatopic regions of the right hemisphere. They're very mixed results. You get tiny effects in some studies and you get no effects in others. Um, I don't know that that's been done in children. Um, I've never heard of a clinical trial that's been done like that in young children, but it is what we would think about developing. And of course, you'd have to have a series of trials to make sure it was safe and that it was helpful and effective. But the idea, I mean, nothing is really needed for what I study for kids who have perinatal strokes. But as you get to children who have strokes at older ages, you start to see some language impairment and uh, you begin to see the language recovery uh, staying in the damaged left hemisphere and not moving over to the right. And so one might imagine from what I've said, well, what if we really encourage the healthy right hemisphere to take over when it wasn't doing so naturally? What if a child had a stroke in a period of time at an age when it no longer happened spontaneously, that language shifted over to the right hemisphere, could we stimulate it to do so and would that be effective? And so that's in fact what we're thinking about, but that's off in the future and nobody has done that to my knowledge. Thank you. Sure. Thanks. Lauren Lineback. You're still muted. Hi, um, thank you very much for this. It's, it's very interesting. My son is a um, also had a left LMC, LMCA stroke and um, definitely struggles with language to this day. Um, he's chatty, but sometimes words really mix him up. But I was just curious. I know there was a lot of talk about like critical periods when he was younger, like, oh, you want to make sure you do this because this is a critical period. Um, in brain development, and if you miss that window, um, the child's never going to acquire, you know, X, Y, Z. Does that apply for language as well, or is that different? No, so that's actually what I studied in my research uh, before I started studying stroke. Um, I worked on whether there are critical or sensitive periods for just anyone to acquire language um, at different ages. Um, I think we tend to convey this to people too dramatically. So the actual effects are that, yes, on the average, if you look at people who haven't had a stroke, but just are, look, are acquiring languages at different ages, there is an age effect. Um, starting younger is better. Um, but the change is very gradual and it depends if you're talking about second language learning it depends on how similar the first language is to the second um, there are there's a small amount of data very very interesting data on deaf people who really have no language early in life and then get exposed to a sign language when they're teenagers and they actually do show a very dramatic um, loss of the ability to acquire language. But in, in between ages, it's a very gradual function. It's not like on Tuesday when you turn five, um, your ability to learn language is gone. Um, it's really a gradual thing and also lots of variation between individuals. So some people are really good at learning languages late in life as adults. And some people are not so good and it depends on what you've learned earlier. So it's a much more complicated, softer quest outcome than what people would say. Uh, I would say the same thing is probably true about stroke at different ages, but really there are very, very few data of the kind that I uh, collect on children who have had childhood strokes. But I would expect that you get some age effects, but not suddenly everything is lost, not at all. Thank you, thank you. Tara, uh, do you wanna ask your question? Sure, um, I was just wondering if there were any, in the children that were represented in the study you were talking about today, were any of them um, needing to see speech language pathologists early in their development? Cause I, I know we're talking about their ultimate outcomes as 
you know, pretty much an adult age. Um, so I'm just wondering if there were any um, needs for intervention um, on the way there. Um, they've all, I mean, we have records about what kind of um, interventions they've had um, in, especially for the kids who come from Children's National Medical Center, they're um, in Washington, D.C., Maryland, and Virginia, there are services that are provided to everyone when a child is identified as having a stroke. Now, of course, as you all know, perinatal strokes are not always identified early, um, they, but they are usually identified at by age seven months or so when kids would ordinarily show motor impairments if the stroke hit the motor strip. In general, everybody has some kind of services, but we don't have good clinical trials uh, determining how much that matters. And of course, no one is run in a condition where they don't have any um, services. Uh, we don't do that in our country, hopefully. Um, my colleagues tell me that there are certainly Country. I mean, in Brazil, for example, where some of my colleagues have worked, they just don't do any rehab. Um, after people have a stroke as adults, they just go home. Um, and so we need more research on how much these things matter. We all hope that all the services that we provide are really doing a lot of good. But honestly, we don't have much in the way of clinical trials. Um, there are very few clinical trials, even for adults, on what the effects of speech therapy are. We give speech therapy to everybody we can, and we hope and pray that it's really helping, but we don't know. Um, so to be really strict in my answer, I would say we don't know. We do have everyone that, I'm, that uh, we study has had some services, but we don't know if they really needed them because there's so much spontaneous acquisition of language. So we don't know. Thank you very much. Yeah, it really made me wonder about um, clinically, like how that would affect my practice because I'm a speech pathologist. I wondered like, oh, hey, they had a stroke. Right. Don't need to see them. See you later. Right. <laughs> Right. That's okay, right. Thank you. I mean, what I would say, but this is just a guess, it's not based on clinical uh, trials, is like, we just want to make sure that kids have a lot of language, um, that they have a lot of environmental language, that they have a lot of interactions. Um, typically, we don't think, at least for second language learners, that just rote repetition is really good for people. It's really natural kinds of interactions and that somebody has lots of time to interact one one to one with children um, or even speakers of uh, second languages, same effect. Um, and so I'm sure that that's what most of you do, um, but we don't, I mean, we need clinical trials to actually demonstrate that these things are important and have big effects. Thank you very much. Sure. Michael, are you able to ask your question? about tests? Sure. Hi. I'm a, a father of an eight-year-old boy with uh, hemiplegia. And um, I just have a question. If I were to go into a clinic, what tests could I ask be administered um, in order to um, show, prove out your research, show them the proof of your research and then give them the ability to apply it to my son? You mean for language tasks, is that, you mean for language? Yeah, language or executive function, either one. Yeah, so um, we, I mean, unfortunately, this is a little bit hard to address because um, I spent a long time when we started doing this, trying to figure out what tests to use to segregate these different abilities. The standard uh, tests that are given by uh, speech pathologists and neuropsychologists don't segregate these abilities completely. Um, but there are, I mean, we use pretty standard executive function measures. There are disfluency measures. Uh, that there's a decaf measure of how fast you can say, how many words you can say in a brief period of time. There's a 
task called brief, which is a measure of executive function. So there are some standard executive function tasks that people are uh, usually given at a neuropsych evaluation. The problem that uh, is not easy to address is what do you do to measure language without executive function? And the commonly used tasks that I've looked at really mix these up. Um, the self, the CL, CELF, um, is a battery of tasks that's typically given by speech pathologists to assess language. And that battery of tests does not separate um, what I call language, what people in my field call language from executive function. The tasks that we use, I mean, I use the TROG2, which I think is a terrific task developed by Dorothy Bishop. Um, we had, I mean, we bought it from the publisher before it went on, uh, out of print. Um, it's not used by speech pathologists. It's normed. It's a great test, um, but it's not what any neuropsychologists use um, or speech pathologists use as a matter of clinical practice. So unfortunately, I don't know what to recommend to you um, because the tasks do mix up these abilities. That's why I tried to emphasize what I did in my talk, but it, that's really available to researchers and not a normal clinical practice. I don't know if any of the speech pathologists have anything to say, any of you in the audience have anything to say about that issue, what you think about assessment. I'm not sure. I'm going to jump to um, Lauren's second question, Lauren Lineback, and um, Patty, if you're able to also help weigh in on this about overall outcomes in addition to language outcomes. Hi. Um, yeah, I was just curious because you showed the, the, the slides of the different brains and then you talked about the kids and um, it seems like they're doing incredibly well. And I'm just curious, like in a more basic sense, maybe like what accounts for the variability in outcome? Is it just like the size of the stroke or is it, to, is it that combined with whatever therapies are then chosen? I'm sure it's a totally complicated question, but something I've always been wondering, like, because yeah. there's so much variability in, in stroke outcome. So that you've just described my um, new grant, but my next grant proposal. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so what we've been, I mean, what we tried to do in the research that we've done so far is be very, very focused um, on who is included and look at the outcomes. And that's because there actually is a lot of prior research on perinatal stroke, but there's not such uh, careful um, selection of who goes into that study. So um, other people's studies include... Um, some prenatal strokes that affect the areas around the ventricles, but not the, corti the cortex. I mean, my thinking is these are all gonna have different outcomes and you really have to be pretty careful clinically about who you include. And so what we've done is to focus more narrowly than any of the research that I know. And what we ended up with was a very, very consistent picture of the outcomes on that clean population. But now, what about everybody else? Um, so my interest is particularly in looking at age, um, but there's also size of stroke and area of damage. Um, and so what we're starting to do is look at all three of those variables. So next study, one next study is what about very small perinatal strokes? I showed you pretty big perinatal strokes. If you look at even uh, the same kind of stroke, but much smaller, we defined our strokes, uh, the ones that qualified for a study as damaging more than one third of the middle cerebral artery territory. That meant it's pretty big and those kids shift over to the opposite hemisphere in their language development. If you look at really small strokes, we have some kids that have really small strokes to the same hemisphere um, they retain language in the left hemisphere. 
And I think their language is also very good, but we don't have very many of them. Perinatal strokes are often pretty big. Um, and so my question is, well, maybe it seems obvious that a small stroke would have a better outcome than a big stroke, but that's not actually clear because the big strokes are then acquiring language in a perfectly uh, undamaged, intact other hemisphere. And the little strokes are going ahead and acquiring language in a um, hemisphere that's supposed to be the language hemisphere, but it's got some damage. And I don't know which of those is better. And then you start adding in um, age. We know that at some point, adult strokes turn into a completely different picture. So we're just now starting to see when does a stroke uh, lead to acquisition in the opposite hemisphere? And is that good? If we could encourage that, would that be better? When do you have a big area of damage, but it stays, but language stays in the damaged hemisphere, which doesn't seem at some point like it's going to be so good for you. Those things are not, I mean, there really isn't, there's almost no research on childhood stroke and language. Yeah. And I, Elisa, I'll, I'll, I'll add a couple of comments. So first, it's an excellent question. I think it's what the parents want to know every single time that they hear my, my child has brain injury. Um, and it doesn't matter what age, but I'm gonna focus on perinatal. Uh, so we know more or less the time in development when the injury is happening. That's very important that you're pointing out is to start getting answers that mean something, you have to be narrow. You have to be very specific because you would not have the possibility to prove the methodology even works. She just proved the methodology works because she selected a group of patients that are alike. So it's not a bag of worm with a lot of things and very variables. And she's learning lessons, and then she spans the she spans the question. So I think we're gonna learn a lot more. There's a lot of groups also studying what fibers, what connections. So the the brain is a network. So if you think about any network, social media, anything, there are particular notches that are more relevant, but there are also these connections, the highways in between. Some of them are slower and faster. So are people looking specifically in perinatal stroke in three or four centers across the world? on the connectomics, so we see this in MRI, and we'll learn also what key parts of those connections, even if it's small, may make it, make a higher impact. So we're gonna try to, to map that out. Right. Uh, what I would say from clinical experience, so now that's the comment on the research. <laughs> let, me, let me just add if I might, because what you just said is so important. Thank you for, uh, for your comments, they're very, very helpful. I mean, that's exactly what we're trying to do. But I also wanted to add, when you see a big stroke in the left hemisphere, it damages the connections, the white matter tracts connect big language regions as well as the major language regions like what's called Broca's area and Wernicke's area. When you look at tiny strokes, you can try to separate, well, what happens if you get a tiny stroke, but it really hits the exact fiber track that connects the front, the frontal area to the temporal area. What's yeah. that going to do? What that means? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Oh, go and on. Sorry. The, the second question, and and these are, this is the challenge. The challenge is to really conclude something that is applicable to people when we see them in the clinic. So when you're having a baby or a child that has a stroke, you look at the MRI. What conversation can you have and what services? That's the most more important thing. Like I almost reserve the outcome to, we really don't know. That's my answer. And, and I think it's very positive. And that's what I try to tell parents. Expect everything you can, treat this kid, give them opportunities. We do know one thing, the brain would not learn, develop, or grow without experience. So it's important that the therapies that these kids get access, but most importantly, what the parents do with them, what the caregivers do with them, are informed by abilities and stages of development the kid is working on. That, to me, is critical in making a good outcome. In 20 years of seeing patients with childhood and adult stroke, we yet don't have a good way to predict why some patients with the same type of acute injury look different, even an MRI and clinical outcome. We know they're genetic factors. So you have a bunch of other genes that control inflammation, regeneration, and those can play a role. And we have very 
we're very, very beginning of understanding any of this, and it's very complex biology. We know what what happens acutely. Some kids are very sick. Some kids are spending a lot of time in the ICU. They don't have the ability to get out and go to therapies or home or for a long period of time. That changes outcomes. Some kids, the seizures are more difficult to treat than others. So there are so many factors from the get-go that are at play. And the part that is a black hole, I would say, is what kind of therapies are they getting? We have to run a survey through the families in our clinic with very granular type of questions. How long? How intense? At what age? Did they receive speed therapy or physical therapy or constraining use movement therapy? It's very hard to put that data and see what is the influence of having access or not, and what type of therapies. And as you know, there's a heterogeneity in whatever is get, everyone is getting. So the question is, the, the outcomes are, as you stated, <laughs> very difficult to predict. Size, age, how sick the kid is, how not able to experience the world. So some strokes really complicate your ability to move for a baby, that's decreased experience. If a stroke complicates your ability to communicate, most of the time, if you're a baby, you can, as you hear today, overcome that and, and find a way to communicate. If you're a little bit older, two, three, four, sometimes not so. So we have limitations of what we can do with them because the communication gets limited. So the experience gets narrowed. So I'm just saying a lot of things in a very confusing manner. I'm gonna end with the outcomes are overall always better than the clinicians in the acute setting tend to tell you <laughs> because they are trying to be cautious and they're trying to set you up for success in the sense of you're going to have to be on the on the fight for this kid. Uh, at the same time, there's a lot of inappropriate conversation that I think happens, but I'm not going to judge that because I'm not one to do so. And there is a lot we need to learn. And that's why we're doing this to really engage with the community. And you see how Elisa's research is not possible with the families not being 100% in. Um, right. and, and this is not just the doctors know, this is the patients know. <laughs> and like We have to get to the point where we can truly work together and learn the trajectory of these children after they had brain injury to start answering better what to expect. Um, I think most importantly, we have to all try to enable these kids to have experience and as broad in all domains as possible, because that's how the brain learns at the end of the day, not by one domain, not by one experience and not at a single time point. <laughs> so we have to be dynamic and kind of in a way, very ingenious <laughs> in how to do the experience because it's not the same for a baby than a two-year-old than a 10-year-old or a 15-year-old. So Thanks. A big answer, but <laughs> yeah, I totally agree. Totally agree. I just would I would just add we've been doing we just finished a clinical trial a couple of years ago with adults um, looking at intensive motor rehabilitation. This is strokes, not what I talked about today, but strokes to the motor system in adults and what kind of rehab matters. Um, what we were looking at, it's called critical periods after stroke study. Um, we were looking at how soon after the stroke should you do rehab, which is another variable. What kind of rehab should you do? So we provided intensive additional rehab at different times, but the intensive additional motor rehab was based on what people chose that they would most like to recover. And that makes a big difference too. So there are many, many variables. Uh, motivation. <laughs> motivation, a great way for the brain to learn anything or right. heal. So we just have a few more questions. Areli, I believe she had to leave, um, but she asked if the damage is located in the brainstem, have you found neuroplasticity helping with speech? So I don't know if you have that research. I don't. No, we don't have that research. Um, it's an important question. I mean, there are certain areas of damage to the brainstem that are going to be really devastating and other areas where it's just um, a very restricted part of the MCA distribution. But we we have not included kids who have only damage to areas in the brainstem. So I don't know. 
Patty, do you have anything to say about brainstem related to speech? We 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 have the experience comes from the lesional work, so the, the, not in in a it's more like series of cases that are reported, and we do know there are parts of the brainstem. So this is the most complicated part of the brain, if you ask me. <laughs> Everything gets concentrated. And the parts of the brainstem that are there to kind of servo assist is like a little bit of a, a gas pedal to the entire cortex that are critical. There's a call activating systems. We know from strokes in those regions that every aspect of cognition, including language, could be severely affected or diminished, at least in, in form. Those are the posterior aspects of the brainstem. And then there are other parts of the brainstem, and I'm trying to be vague here, but it's very different. It's the midbrain, the pons of the medulla. There are other parts of the brainstem where the motor component becomes the thing that impairs in the development out of a child to acquire language or develop it at a certain speed. But usually, even with a lot of the sartria, that's what we call the impairment of the motor aspect of the speech, uh, these children manage to produce language and acquire a very comprehensive, receptive ability to understand language. And then there is another part of the brainstem, which is more integration of sensory modalities that are necessary. Um, those are much less understood and even less in development. And just to give you a sense in kids, everything I talk to is about adult and older children, uh, but in children and kids, most of these injuries to the brainstem in a stroke, when it's not traumatic brain injury, uh, it comes from vascular malformations. So cavernous malformations and AVMs are the ones that tend to give you focal deficits. It's much and much less common with vasculitis and the classic ischemic stroke that a perinatal stroke can do. So it's going to be a long time, I would I would say, to know exactly how this brainstem lesions affect development of any function in a very early childhood stroke. They're very uncommon and there's yeah. very few patients. Okay, um, Megan, I wanted to check in with you. Was your question answered when um, Alyssa talked about um, teasing apart executive function testing from language testing? Yes, I feel like Michael kind of asked a similar question and then also hearing more about the areas of the brain that aren't being researched as much yet. I feel like it globally got me there. So thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, Yari has asked uh, if exposure to various languages helps as a stimulation tool to support language development or emergence. So that's a really interesting question. Um, I do not know of any research looking at multiple languages uh, and their effect on uh, development after a stroke. Um, if you look at just the regular child development literature um, in the United States for quite a long time until recently, there's always been this bias against multiple languages, which isn't supported by any research. Um, Americans are very monolingual compared to the rest of the world, but the rest of the world tells us that being bilingual, being multilingual is perfectly normal. Um, kids hit their milestones at the same time. There's some evidence that learning multiple languages or two languages, most of the re research is on two languages rather than multiple, that there are benefits, um, they provide some, what's thought of as a reservoir against the effects of adult stroke. Um, There's some evidence that switching back and forth between languages enhances your executive function abilities. Um, but I don't know of any evidence about what happens uh, if there are beneficial effects of multiple languages on recovery from stroke. We actually, I mean, we have a number of participants in our research who have more than one language at home. And um, to be honest, we set them aside for now because we don't have enough uh, kids to do a whole other group, but we don't mix them with the kids who are mostly monolingual English speakers. So I don't know um, about the effects of, of that, but I would say in general, 
speaking multiple languages is the norm around the world. That's the way language generally works. The United States is particularly uh, monolingual, probably because of its geography, because it's so big, we don't have boundaries that we share with, like, with countries that speak other languages. So that's what usually drives people to be multilingual, okay. being around a country where somebody speaks a different language, so you just pick it up. Patty? I'll, I'll add a very short comment about, there's, uh, an invest, there's a researcher, Patricia Cole, K-U-H-L. Yes, yeah, she's um, a good guy, right. Exactly, who has a study this question about how a, how a baby is born. Is it born, born monolingual, multilingual? The answer is we're all multilingual at birth. And somewhere between six and eight months of age, she found these babies with beautiful studies tend to close that gate to what is most meaningful. And that usually is caregiver. And she also showed this. And that's the, my comment here is, it's not about getting the kid to go to school and learn languages and stuff is very early on that if the language comes from a meaningful social interaction, a caregiver or someone that is really in person, they even study the effect of a remote interaction and it's not the same. Yeah. So if I can add to that since this is yeah. now my, really my field. Um, actually, uh, the, the data, the original data on that topic are from Janet Worker's lab. Um, it's basically, uh, it's not that kids are multilingual, it's that they're set up to be able to discriminate all the different sounds that all the languages of the world use. By the time they get to be six to 10 months, they narrow to only retaining discrimination of the, the ones that are in the environment. Mm -hmm. um, but we oh. do research with babies all the time where we don't interact with them. We actually play audio signals. We just play streams of speech. Mm -hmm. Babies can learn that also. Um, you don't have my, to. My comment was, was on the, with people. Yeah, excellent. And heard that it, yes. My, my comment was on the quality of how a language is communicated. If the language comes from someone that the baby has a meaningful interaction, it's always helpful. And, and this is something for the parents, and this is from the clinic. I see a lot of parents that are Spanish speaking or a different language that when the kid has had brain injury, they try to simplify things to the kid and switch to English. We don't have any evidence that that's necessary or provides any benefit. What we do have evidence of is that your best mastered language and you feel more comfortable and can express your emotions better tend to have beneficiary effects on the development of a child. And that comes not just from language, comes from a lot of health, mental health research. What I'm trying to say is speak the language you feel in your heart and that communicates with your child the best. And that will almost for sure be beneficiary to the kid uh, as, as it develops and learns after brain injury. So yeah. that, that was where yeah. I was going, at <laughs> least, I don't know if you support this, but the, the, oh, mention of the research was, was for this. It's pretty remarkable. So um, uh, children can learn languages just from listening to an audio stream. We do it in our research in, in the infant lab, um, but it's not the best way to learn a language, of course, I agree. Okay, if time, there's two more questions, and one I'm going to direct at Patty because it's a it's asking um, about acquiring fine motor control and speech. So I'm particularly interested in hearing um, Patty talk about this because I've heard her speak about this in the clinic. Um, it especially when when a kid is very oral and wants to chew on everything. Um, what connection that might have to developing speech and also developing fine motor control. Okay, and try I got I'll try to answer this quickly. Um we know that a lot and, and we are not talking about communication. That's a much broader thing. We're talking about speech, verbal <laughs> output of a way of communicating. We know that the fine motor skills that you see in a hand are geographically and in terms of connectivity closely map in the brain of anyone at birth before brain injury very close to the area of the brain that coordinates a lot of the tongue larynx and mouth which are the things that we use to phonate to produce these phonemes that we make vowels and consonants together when we see kids in the clinic 
One of the tools that children, very early baby, perinatal stroke, they're using to increase the input to an affected side of the brain is to, and all babies do this. You see all babies taking things to the mouth and they're experiencing the world through the mouth. The mouth has in very large representation of sensory integration in the brain. So it's a necessary step in normal development to experience this connection between hand and mouth and mouth and anything <laughs> in the world, object, temperature, all kinds of sensory modalities to start mapping, not just the sensory, what that thing is, but also to map the how I move and kind of articulate my finger motion and my mouth and lips and tongue, which are very important for speech. So one thing we see in kids that have a stroke, perineal stroke, is that this period of mouthing things, just to put it very simple, gets a little bit prolonged in time. And we don't want to get in the middle of it. A lot of parents are very concerned about drooling and that the drooling is there and then maybe, or that the kid is using things like opacifiers and things like that. I'm not going to get into the teeth part. <laughs> I'm going to say is I encourage the exploration of using the mouth and the hand and the mouth and the hand together, okay? And also the other hand usually comes to play with the affected hand and also increasing the experience of that hand. This is sensory, this is visual. And when I touch and I look at my hand, I get a chance to map things differently inside the brain. So there is more food for experience if you want it. So we always encourage people not to be too concerned about the drooling once they are, we know they're not choking and the swallowing is safe, okay? <laughs> the, the drooling is part of their concentration and trying to master a skill with their hands tends to leave the mouth in less activity. A lot of people can drool even as adults and doing this, but in the kid specifically, let, allowing that experience of the mouth with objects or the hand. And a lot of these kids use things that they chew. And in fact, is part of the spectrum in autism spectrum as well. And there are tools that you can even give them if you don't want them to be unsafe because they're putting everything in the mouth and they should not put little things. There are toys and things that speech therapists tend to use to allow them to have things to take to the mouth. And when we see this mouth being allowed to do what it wants, when they're working on the hand and vice versa, these kids tend to benefit from that. And at once, they don't have the stress of someone telling them there's something wrong with them and they shouldn't be doing something, which interferes the learning experience. But also we think it maximizes the ability to map. Um, and by anyone, if you go to see pianists, very high professional pianists, look at their mouth and what it's doing when they're really playing really hard. Almost all of them have movement of their lips, tongues, and even if they have suppressed it, you can see still the movements of that mouth this is mapped very close to that, just as a, as a concept that any parent can use. So allow the kids to experience this. And I don't have any, any, any issues with taking things to the mouse, even if a two, three-year-old is working on improving their fine motor skills and their speech articulation. Thanks. Uh, Andrea, do you want to ask about sign language? I know Alyssa also has expertise in that domain. Um, yes, I was curious because last night I've been having a course in my tomatis training and uh, we've been talking, discussing, learning um, via listening training. So um, that would be, would be interesting in how sign language can help to bridge the development of language. So sure. it's like if that if the brain is affected of uh, on that side, it's like um, and the um, I don't know how much the hearing would be um, influenced and how much the understanding of speech, the perception, the hearing, the, the understanding the words, the speech production and choosing and speaking the words would be affected by the stroke. And do you have any idea how sign language can influence areas in the brain, in the brain to generate the flow of information yes. regarding language and therefore learning? Yeah. So we do have lots of research on um, deaf individuals without a stroke, um, on how sign language is represented in the brain, how it's acquired. I've worked in that field. My husband is actually a deaf native signer um, and my children are bilingual. 
um, in American Sign Language and English. Um, but the uh, evidence that we have shows us very clearly that sign languages uh, are controlled by the exact same regions of the brain as spoken languages. There isn't any difference. And so the same regions will be affected uh, with uh, in adults, let's say, um, if you have a stroke to the left hemisphere, MCA territory, it's going to produce sign language aphasia. Um, what I don't know about is what happens if you look at um, deaf children who have a perinatal stroke. We don't, I don't know of any research on that topic, but my guess is that it's going to have the same picture as what I talked about because the brain areas that control sign language aren't any different. That's surprising. I mean, you'd think that maybe uh, the brain areas that control spoken language are placed where they are because of the nature of use of the mouth and use of the auditory system and sign language might be somewhere else because it's using the hands and the, and the visual system instead of the auditory system. But interestingly, it's not. Language is in the same regions regardless of the modality. And language around the world, different spoken languages all show activation in the very same left hemisphere region. So there's something that those areas have uh, over evolution have really become language areas and not speech areas um, in particular. Thanks. Thank you very so much. much. That was helpful. <laughs> I'm glad and thanks to everyone for staying. Thanks again, Alyssa, for the, the meaningful talk and discussion. I will send a follow-up survey as well as ways for you all to stay connected with us and uh, we'll look forward to a new season in the fall. Have a great, great day and weekend. Bye. Bye. Thanks to all of you. Bye.